All right, so let's get started here. As an introduction to developer testing, my name is Will Green. It's my email address, homepage, and Twitter. So first, the caveat. I am not an expert. I am not Kent Beck. Kent Beck is the father of extreme programming. He invented CRC cards. He invented the JUnit and JUnit Max testing frameworks. He is an expert. I'm not Ward Cunningham. Ward Cunningham is the father of the wiki and the FIT framework for integration test framework. He's an expert. I'm not Martin Fowler. He's the chief scientist of ThoughtWorks, multi-time author, one of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto. He's an expert. I'm not Robert C. Martin. This guy's written more books than I can shake a stick at. Um, if you're into Agile development, this, is, this guy is an expert. I mention these guys because you should read up on them. But I am Will Green. I am an aspiring software craftsman. I'm also the co-host of the Iron Languages podcast. And I read a lot, I practice a lot, I learn a lot, and sometimes I fail. But uh, what this presentation is about is techniques for developer testing, what it is, how to do it, how to do it effectively. Again, I'm not an expert, so this kind of represents what I've learned in the last year doing this stuff in earnest. So, are you ready to drink from the fire hose? Because I got a lot of information to throw at you. First of all, don't think test. The purpose of testing is to gain an understanding that you don't already have, not an understanding that you already do have. This is uh, Scott Bellware, he's a multi-time uh, C-sharp MVP, also a very controversial figure. Uh, if code exists slowly to allow, solely to allow unit testing, it probably means your design is wrong. It's Jimmy Bogart, he's a uh, .NET developer in Texas. A good unit test should first help us evolve the design of the interface before focusing on the implementation. So what do all these, what do all these quotes have in common? <coughs> tests aren't tests. They don't really describe what's going on here. Testing is about specification, and testing are, testing's about design. Test suites happen to be an artifact in the design process, a very useful artifact, but an artifact nonetheless. It's not about the test, it's about design. So TDD, a lot of people think it's test-driven development. Wrong, it's test-driven design. Write the code that you wish you had. If the code's hard to test, it's probably going to be hard to use. And wouldn't you rather find that out now than two days, two weeks, two months from now, when you have to go back and change it? Because let's face it, you're gonna have to go back and change it. Requirements change, sometimes often, sometimes daily. Done right, it helps you adhere to the principles of object-oriented design. Solid, like a rock. So dependency is, dependency management is hard. We face it every day, how we're gonna set up our project structures, how modules are gonna relate to each other, it's the single greatest influencer of quality in software projects. The foundation for creating soft, and it's also the foundation for, so for creating software that exhibits qualities that we aspire to when we create our software. So poorly managed dependencies lead to code that's hard to change, that's fragile, you don't want to touch it, you're afraid of breaking something, and it's not reusable. Well-managed dependencies, on the other hand, they lead to code that's flexible, that's robust, and you can reuse it. And ultimately, isn't that kind of the goal of creating software? You don't want to have to create something new every single time. You want to build on what you have. So again, undesirable, hard to change. You want it to be easy to change. Fragile versus robust, not reusable versus reusable. So solid, therefore, it's the foundational set of principles for managing dependencies in your software project. It's therefore the foundation for creating software that exhibits those qualities that we said we, we admire, that we want in our projects. So, so what is solid? Set of five principles. 
single responsibility principle, the open close principle, the Liskov substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. We'll go into each one of these in just a second. Let's start with SRP. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. All right. The single, responsi single responsibility principle states that a class should have one and only one reason to change. Let's talk about a reporting module for a second. What are all the things that you would want to do in a reporting module? Somebody throw, some, right, throw something out there. Fetching data, maybe. Report, you know, generating the report, printing it, formatting it. Those are all four different reasons for a class to change. So it stands to reason that you wouldn't want to have one class that did all four of those things. Because if any one of those things change, your one class has to change. It's about localizing change to a small module. Open close principle. Open chest surgery is not needed when putting on a coat. You should be able to extend a class without modifying it. That is, you should be able to build extensions on top of something you already have there without having to dig into the guts of it. Let's say you have a database connection factory class. All right, and that class knows about creating a SQL Server connection, an Oracle connection, and an Access connection. Well, now you decide you want to also throw SQLite in there, because really, Access kind of sucks, and let's get that out of there. I shouldn't have to go into that database connection factory and tell it how to do that. All right? I should be able to extend the database creation factory so that it can uh, create these new types of database connections. Liskov substitution principle. It looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but needs batteries. You probably have the wrong abstraction. All right? Basically, this says that derived classes must be substitutable for their base classes. The classic example is a square that derives from a rectangle. All right? Square is more restrictive than a rectangle class. A rectangle's got a width and a height, but they don't have to be the same. Square has to be the same. All right? So if a square derives from a rectangle class, then any class, then any other class that uses a square, if you pass it a rectangle, that class is going to break in ways that you don't know. Because you go and set the width on something and set the height to something else, if you've got a rectangle, you're, you're expecting them to change independently. With a square class, they change together. The interface, interface segregation principle. You want me to plug that where? What this says is you want to make fine-grained interfaces that are client-specific. What this means is, let's say you have a class that represents issues and recommendations, all right? And it needs some services for persisting those to the database. You don't want to create an interface. Issue, issues don't need to know how to save recommendations. Don't need, not, don't need to know how to update recommendations. Likewise for recommendations. They don't need to know anything about issues. It's not their responsibility. It's, they don't need to know about it. Now your implementation can be the same class. It just implements multiple interfaces. The dependency inversion principle. Would you solder a light bulb or a, a, a lamp directly into the wall socket? Probably not. What this means, basically, is you want to depend on abstractions, not concretions, not specific implementations, excuse me. So if you have, basically what this means is if your class has dependencies, you should pass them into the class, not have that class create them internally. All right? Because if the implementation of one of those things change, that the, your class has to change as well. So uh, Bob Martin does a much better job of explaining these, and I've linked to each one of them, uh, uh, each one of his explanations here on each one of these slides, and these slides will be available later on SlideShare. So, now that we've talked about design, let's talk about test-driven design. 
It's got three simple rules. You're not allowed to write any production code unless it is to make a failing unit test pass. I'm sorry, I feel like, uh, yes. Rule number two, you are not allowed to write any more of the unit tests than is sufficient to fail. And compilation failures are failures. And rule three, you are not allowed to write any more production code than is sufficient to pass the one failing unit test. So there's a flow to this test-driven design. Write a test, watch it fail. Write the code to make that test pass. Watch it pass. Refactor, this is a big one, and we'll come back to it later. See step one, so it's a cycle. You wanna keep going around in this cycle until you have clear, until you have the simplest implementation possible. I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the TDD demo for now. <laughs> I'll do it later if we have time. So, how to test. Uh, I saw a lot of .NET developers in here and a lot of Java developers. My examples are in .NET because that's what I do for a day job. And that's where I can pull examples from. So let's look at this example here. This is an end unit test case. Uh, test. We'll break it down in the next few slides. So what we're testing here actually is this issue view model. Can, can we hit the lights? I'm not sure if this is clear enough. Cool. Better? Can you see better? All right. What we're testing here is issue view model. So let's start with naming the test. There's a number of different ways to do it, but this is a way that I found helpful, and this is a way that Roy Osherov recommends in his book, The Art of Unit Testing. Start, start with the method being tested. So we are going to be testing the finding method, actually the finding property, on this issue view model. Next, include any conditions, any preconditions for your test. So what we're doing here is just assignment. Finally, end up with your expected outcome. So we're gonna say that when we, when the finding, when we do an assignment, it marks the issue as modified. So there's a basic pattern for creating unit tests. It's called AAA, arrange, act, assert. What it does is it separates what's being tested from the setup and verification steps. It makes it clear what it is you're doing and what you expect the outcome to be. It also makes uh, test smells more obvious. And we'll go into these test smells later. But first, the arrange. You want to arrange all the necessary preconditions for the thing you're testing. I've highlighted that in red here. So we've got, we've got our, view, our issue view model here. It depends on this terminology collection class and it depends on some data services, so we need to set those up first. I'll go into the semantics here of this generate mock a little bit later. Then we create our view model, and we also need to assign an issue in that view model. So we need to build one up real quick. Act. Act on the object that's under test. So we're just going to set the issue and then set the finding property on that view model. That's what we're testing. We're testing the assignment of that finding property. Assert. Assert that the expected outcome has actually occurred. I've got two asserts here, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we're testing, to, we're asserting that this enumeration, attr.modify and issue view model, that issue change state, are the same, are equal. And we also want to assert that the has issue changed property is true. All right, that's one logical assert per test, even though we've got two actual asserts here. So things to remember, AAA, arrange, act, assert, takes small steps. That's, what, that's the best way to go about test driven design, is small steps. Even though it doesn't matter how big and complicated your system is, Keep it small. We can only hold so much in our hands at any one time. Keep it focused. Run your tests after every change. This is really important. And tests are code. Just like every other code, you're going to have to maintain them. You're going to have to go back and revisit them. 
So let's talk about test doubles. Mock, stub. Remember I mentioned setting up this mock data services here? This happens to be uh, Rhino mocks. So think of stunt double. It's a stand-in for production code. That piece of code is not what we're concerned with in our test, but we need it anyway. So there's many types of testing doubles, each with their own purpose. I'm going to list out five here that are from Martin Fowler's week, uh, wiki entry on it. First is dummy objects. They're usually just passed in to satisfy some condition, like for example, in a constructor and somewhere in the constructor it checks to see if the object is null. Well, you can't really pass in a null object here. But you don't really use it anywhere. You just simply use it to fill that parameter list and get your test running. Next are fake objects. They do have working implementations, but usually just enough to get the test running. They're definitely not suitable for production. For example, an in-memory database, like SQLite in-memory. want That would not be good to have in production, because as soon as you shut down the app or the machine, well, there goes your data. Next are stubs. They provide canned answers to the SUT. SUT is system under test. Right? They are a way to control what's to control these third-party dependencies. Right? They usually don't respond to anything other than what you program them for for the uh, context of that specific test. Next are spies. Spies are basically stubs with a little bit of smarts. Um, they record some information about how they were called, and you can then go back and make assertions on these on these stubs to make sure that things were called in the correct way. For example, an email service that records messages that were sent, or just the number of messages that were sent. Say you're expecting 10 messages, messages to be sent, this spy will record each time. And if it, if it wasn't 10, well then you have a failing test. And finally, the most complicated are mocks. They're pre-programmed with expectations. They should be called directly by the, the system under test. Um, they throw an exception. If they receive a call, they weren't expecting. And when the test, when you actually finish testing, you can check them to make sure that everything you told them to expect is there. So you say, I want exactly this behavior, no more, no less. If it doesn't meet that criteria, the test should fail. So let's talk about refactoring. This is a very important part of test driven development could make that better. Just like in writing or anything else, the first time you do something, probably not the best time, but you need it to get something working. So why refactor it? You want to improve the human readability of code, because let's all remember, it's people writing code. Code is for us. High level languages like C Sharp, Java, PHP, it's for us developers. <coughs> Uh, you want to reduce the, the complexity in order to maintain, uh, to improve maintainability, and you want to create a more ex expressive internal structure so you can more easily grasp what's going on with your system just by looking at it. Bottom line is it's about design. <coughs> so what is refactoring? Factoring is a disciplined approach to improving an, an existing <coughs> body of code. It's altering the code's internal structure without changing its external behavior, and that's key. It's also a series of very small steps that on their own don't do much, but when you pile them up, they have a big effect on the code. And you're changing a lot, so the risk of change is mitigated by running your automated tests, which you have done beforehand, after each step in the process. Make sure you haven't broken anything. What refactoring is not, it's not undisciplined. It's not something you do when you change the external behavior. You're changing the code at that point, you're not refactoring. It's not one giant step. And it's not done without a safety net of automated tests. If you're doing any of those things, you are not refactoring. You're just changing things willy-nilly. You're not being responsible, you are not being professional. 
So we've talked about how to test. Let's talk about how not to test. So there's things that you make you go, mm, this just isn't quite right, or this is harder than it should be. All right, most of this is summarized from X unit test patterns, the book and the website, but I'll, I'll go over them quickly here. So let's talk about code smells. Things that, you, things that stick out at you when you're looking at the test code. First is an obscure test. It's kind of difficult to understand what the test is doing. It's either because you've got too much information or too little information in your test. What you can do is you can keep your test small and focused and don't depend on external resources. <coughs> Conditional test logic, this is another no-no. Um, this is when it's hard to know exactly what the test is going to do when it really matters. Right? When you're refactoring, if you're not clear what your test is, is verifying, how do you know that what you've done hasn't completely broken your system? Right? You don't want conditional logic to, to handle when your system under test fails to return valid data. You want a separate test for that. Uh, you don't want loops to verify the contents of collections, and you don't want conditionals to verify complex objects. Use custom asserts for that. And in Ruby and RSpec, those are custom matchers. Um, NUnit itself and, and C Sharp includes a set of uh, collection uh, certs. They're very helpful for this. Hard to test code. Code is hard to test if it's highly coupled, if it's asynchronous code, or if it's just plain untestable code. What you want to do is you want to reduce that coupling by using TDD and adhering to those solid principles. Test code duplication. Just like in production code, copy and paste and reinventing the wheel is bad. You have, if you do it more than once, you should refactor. You should create utility methods. You should use factory classes. And test logic in production, another big no-no. Um, conditional logic for tests only. Test, test dependency in production, yeah, you don't want that. And test specific equality. You don't want to introduce code into your production code that's only for, um, only for testing purposes. If you need your class to behave differently, you're probably using an OO language, so subclass it. Override the behavior. Wrap that behavior so you can test it, so you can get at what you want. Let's talk about behavioral smells, things that happen, things that stick, jump out at you when you're running the tests, now that you've got them written. Assertion roulette. It's hard to tell exactly which <coughs> assertion failed in your tests. Um, this usually happens when you're trying to verify too much or tests or assertions that don't have clear failure messages. Some of the ways around that are one logical assertion for test. I showed you an example before where we had two assertions, and, but it was okay because it, it was clear what we were doing and they were both logically related to the action that was being performed. Um, include a failure message for that assertion. Most uh, in any unit, there's uh, usually a third, a second or third parameter, depending on the assert, that you can put in a string to say what happened or what didn't happen. Or you can use a GUI test runner. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Erratic tests, tests that depend on each other, bad. Resource leakages or scarcity, shared state different random values for each test run. You don't know what's really going on if you do that. Use a fresh test fixture for each test. Set up the things that you need to set up for each individual test. Uh, clean up after yourself. Uh, in .NET, if you're using an unmanaged resources, make sure you dispose of them when you're done with your test. Uh, use databases, use database sandboxes or a fake database. You don't want to run a series of tests against the same database. You want to start fresh every time. Otherwise, it's unclear what's changed or if something you've done in a previous test is going to affect the outcome of this test. That makes it non-deterministic and useless. Fragile tests. 
So your test fails to compile or fails to pass um, when you've changed your system in ways that don't directly affect uh, the, the test, the, the thing that you're actually exercising. It could be due to data sensitivity. It could be to over-specifying behavior. Um, it's too complicated a mock object setup could lead to this. Um, possible solutions are don't depend on the database. Uh, encapsulate uh, setup behind creation methods. And abstract away dependencies, including time. Time is a difficult one, but it's doable. And frequent debugging. The debugger is a waste of time. Not, not saying that debugging is bad altogether, but if you're spending a majority of your time in the debugger, you're doing it wrong. All right? It's caused by a lack of defect localization, meaning you're missing tests, or your tests aren't run frequently. So you only want to create behavior after you have a failing test. And I've run into this a number of times. I think, oh, this is just a simple little test. It encapsulates so very, very small bit of behavior. I don't need to write a test for it. Then subsequent tests of the larger system <coughs> fail in ways that just don't make any sense, and I have to fire up the debugger. And the, t and the time it took me to fire up the debugger and run that, I could have written tests. I should have written tests. Yeah? So one thing I've noticed when, when I get bug reports from users, my first reaction used to be to head right for the debugger. Mm -hmm. And now I find that I've adopted TDD. The very first thing I do is I run to write a test that encapsulates that, that defect. And mm -hmm. I find the reason for the defect much faster than if I try and spend a lot of time in the debugger. Exactly. Debuggers are slow, too, especially if you have a very tightly coupled uh, desktop application. You have to fire it up. You have to set up some, some things. Decouple your code. Start there. Start breaking things down. Also, run your tests continuously. Uh, in Ruby and now also in .NET, we have auto tests. Every time you save your files, it runs your tests. There's also this, thing, this notion of continuous integration. We'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. Manual intervention. A test requires you to step in in order to verify that something happened. Yeah, you don't want to do that. That's a waste of your time. Um, you want to be careful in setting up your automated tests. Remember, these are automated, so you can run them over and over and over and over again. Um, tests that aren't self-checking, tests that are hard to set up programmatically. Um, invest time in setting up the automation for your tests. Um, and decouple, again, decouple your code. Say, for example, you have an event that's, that's kind of difficult to generate. You can decouple the actual event from the code that gets run when that event fires. So you can test it, because what you're really interested in is the behavior of that code, not the event itself. Slow tests, tests that take a long time to run, this usually happens when you have a dependency on a web service, or a database, or the file system. All these things are slow. You want to keep it in memory, keep it fast. Um, you have a heavy test fixture that gets rebuilt for every single test. Um, asynchronous tests or explicit delays in your tests. I know you see this. I've run into this a lot with um, WinForms UI code, or too many tests which most people don't have a problem with too many tests. Um, one of the things you can do is abstract away these third-party resources. There are things available for abstracting away the database, uh, for the file system, for web services. In fact, in .NET, we now have system.io.abstractions. That's a, another layer around the file system, so you don't have to depend on the file system being there and worrying about permissions and things like that. Um, use an immutable shared fixture, or if you can, Set up your heavy fixture first, then duplicate it. And every time you run that test, use a new copy of that initial fixture. Because it's oftentimes easier to just duplicate that initial fixture than it is to set up a new one every single time. Um, and run a fast subset of your tests more frequently, and the entire suite less frequently. But by all means, run all of your tests at least once a day. 
Now, project level smells. These are higher level smells. These are things that a project manager can look out for. Buggy tests. They're usually caused by lower level things like fragile tests, obscure tests, hard to test code. Learn to write tests properly. Refactor legacy code to make testing easier and more robust. Mike Feathers actually has a very good book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code that teaches you uh, a number of different techniques for getting a test, a test suite around your legacy code. Legacy code, by the way, are code without tests. And use test-driven development, test-driven design from the outset. Developers not writing tests. Oh, I don't have enough time. This code is hard to test. Learn. Invest the time to learn. You're a professional. You are a software developer. You learn new things all the time. Spend the time, spend the effort to learn how to write tests effectively. Writing these tests takes less and less time the more you do it. I know I used to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes to write a test when I first started. Now, 30 seconds. And also, the more you work with it, the better understanding you have of the code that you do already have. And that can only be a good thing. So high test maintenance costs. You have fragile tests. You have tests that people aren't really sure what it's doing. Learn good test automation strategies. Run your tests continuously. Use a continuous integration server. Usually what a, a continuous integration server is, it's a central server that every time you, anytime a developer on your team checks in code, it grabs a copy of everything, rebuilds it, and runs your tests. So you know quickly, it's about quick feedback, knowing quickly when, if something's gone wrong. Okay. So you can address it then, rather than three months from now when your formal testing uh, takes place, or God forbid, it gets out in the wild and your users find it. Because by then, it's a whole nother level of headache to be able to find. This goes back to production code. You've got, you've got untested code, you're missing tests, or you've lost tests. Make sure that every test you write is run somehow automatically. Make sure it's part of, in .NET, make sure it's part of that solution that gets run every time the continuous integration server is run. Make sure all your tests are run. If you've got slow tests, break it up. Run it less frequently. Maybe run it three times a day instead of every check-in. At work, um, what I did, we had a set of unit tests and integration tests. The integration tests took a long time, 15 minutes after the build, which took 35, 40 minutes. We don't want to run those all the time, but they were still important, so we ran them three times a day. Unit tests we ran every time, uh, every time somebody checked in code. We had, uh, we were up to, up to about a thousand unit tests that were running in under a minute on the build server. Locally, they ran in. 25, 30 seconds. So this is the .NET specific portion of the presentation. These are testing tools that I use. So we've got NUnit, MDUnit, XUnit.NET. These are frameworks for writing your unit tests, or any test, period. Um, they're essentially, they're a search engine with syntax, with syntactic sugar on top. Uh, those in the Java world, JUnit, uh, in Ruby, you've got the built-in test unit. I don't know about any for PHP. Sorry, it's been a long time. <laughs> PHP unit? Great. Excellent. Support libraries. Object factories. In .NET, there's this great open source library called EndBuilder. Um, in Ruby, we have Factory Girl, Machinist. There's a number of different ones. I'm sure there's one for Java as well. And our test doubles and isolation frameworks, there is no shortage of them in .NET. They range from the open source ones, um, hand-rolled mock objects that you create yourself. Sometimes those are the best route to go. Uh, there's also Rhino mocks, which I showed you an example of. Mock and mock, easymock.net, I believe these are all open source. Then you've got the commercial ones um, from Type Mock Isolator, which I've heard is great, but I personally don't recommend because it even though it allows you to 
uh, test code that would normally be very hard to test, it gets away from the pain of that code being hard to test. So you don't you tend not to fix it, which is a bad thing. And Telerik just mock, I haven't looked at it yet, but it's up there. Test runners. I use NUnit primarily. NUnit comes with both a command line and a GUI runner. Um, in Visual Studio, you can get some integration for, uh, with testdriven.net, and also Visual NUnit. Visual NUnit is available in the uh, extension gallery. There's also add-ins, JetBrains ReSharper or DevExpress CodeRush. I used to be a CodeRush guy, I'm a ReSharper guy now. It's, I just find it's better. Integrates with Visual Studio, it tells you visually the status of your tests in line in the editor with your code, which is immensely helpful. And we talked about the continuous integration server. I like JetBrains Team City because it's free for small teams. Um, there's also Hudson, which I think uh, more Java developers use. And there's a couple others as well. Test guidance. Okay, you, you've, you've kind of got the gist of how to do test driven development or, or testing. Best guidance is pair programming. Having somebody there sitting beside you saying, is that really a good idea? Should, I, should, you, should we really be doing that? If you can't do pair programming in your place, do code reviews. Do it every week, every two weeks. Let, get another set of eyeballs on your code. Yeah? Also call the practice of get the QA before you get past the data and you test things basically. Mm -hmm. you get stuff going at head before they start getting one of them. How they're going to start testing this and you mm -hmm. find exciting things Exactly. Yeah, a lot of times your QA team is a lot more in touch with how your customers use your product than you as a developer are. So you can gain great insights just from spending half an hour sitting with a QA person and saying, this is the feature I need to develop. What's it going to affect with what we already have out there? What are some things that you know, a user might do? Because we're developers, we're not, let's face it, we're usually not user focused. We like the code. That's just the way we are. So it's nice to pair, to pair and work with somebody who does have that focus. Uh, there's also automated tools, a new one uh, from Typemock. This one's free, it's called TestLint. It's great, it's another Visual Studio add-in. It sits there and gives you, uh, it looks at your tests as you're writing them. It says, hmm, maybe you shouldn't have that conditional logic there in your test. Let me make a suggestion on a better way to do that. Resources. Uh, Bob Martin's Agile Principles, Patterns, and Practices at C Sharp. Great book. Bob's also a Java developer. Working effectively with legacy code. I had the pleasure of actually meeting Mike Treathers last month. Great guy. He lives and breathes working with legacy code. He helps teams take their product from something laden with legacy code to something covered with tests that they can make changes to and respond to customer needs more quickly. Refactoring. Highly, highly recommend this book. Written by Martin Fowler. Primary author, but there's four others you can see there. Uh, the Art of Unit Testing with Examples in .NET by Roy Oshiro. He is a MVP .NET, great, great book, pretty quick read, 250 pages or so. You may not totally agree with everything that's in there, but it gives you a place to start with, to start the discussion. Throwing object-oriented software guided by tests. I haven't read this myself, but I've heard a lot of people recommend this. And testing ASP.NET web applications uh, by Jeff McWhether and Ben Hall. Ben Hall is a C Sharp MVP out of the UK. Met him, he's a really nice guy. He's also very active in the Iron Ruby community as well. <coughs> There's also a number of MSDN magazine articles covering uh, design and testing. Uh, a series of videos. Uh, TDD with Kent Beck. Highly recommend this. I haven't seen this myself, but a number of people that I respect recommend getting these. I think it's $9 or maybe $25 for a set of three or five videos. Yeah, it's usually like not $7 to $9 a video from the price. 
Yeah, from Top Nine Programmer. Um, Corey Haynes got a couple of uh, interesting conversations with J.D. Rainsberger. Um, the Codesmanship videos with Jason Gorman, they're available for free on YouTube. Short 10, 15 minute videos showing you how to do DVD, how to do refactoring, test smells. These are usually in Java. And the Tech Pub Concept Series, it's by James Avery and Rob Connery. Rob Connery used to work for Microsoft. Uh, the Concept Series is a free set of videos. Goes over basics. I would highly recommend. Podcasts. I've been spending the last year, three hours a day in the car commuting. So podcasts have been invaluable to me. I've listened to a lot. Um, there's a set of four from Hansel Minutes. Uh, Scott Hanselman, who works for Microsoft. Um, Solid Principles with Robert C. Martin. And again, a re not really a rehash of it, but a clarification of it after some reaction by Joel Spolsky. Um, there's also talking about TVV with Scott Belware. If you don't know Scott, he's a very colorful individual. <coughs> Entertaining nonetheless. Um, Coding 2A podcast, if you have iPhone developers in here, TDD on the iPhone, which I've heard is not the easiest experience to get going, but that's some information on how to do it. Uh, and the Software Engineering Radio podcast on TDD. It's also a series of websites. The, the five principles, the solid principles I talked about here, those are all on Uncle Bob's, uh, Robert C. Martin's website here, with detailed discussions of each one of those. Um, X unit test patterns book, applicable no matter what language you're in, because they're all based on the same core principles. Uh, object mentor blog, uh, that's where both Bob and um, Mike Feathers work. Uh, there's also Martin Fowler's blog, lots of valuable information on there. He's been doing this for a long time. And Roy Oshro's blog, he actually does, he's actually done a series of screencasts where he critiques uh, test suites from different applications and provide some guidance on how you might, might how, how the author might have done something better. That's it. <laughs> Questions? I just have some few minutes. I don't know if you talked about, when you're talking about the cycle of, of TD, mm -hmm. one of the very first things I ran into when I started was like, the, sort of the, you, when you look at that cycle and you think about, I'm gonna write a little tiny test, I'm gonna write some little tiny production code, it seems like at first it's gonna be a big, long loop that you're gonna waste all this time. Um, I think what a lot of people come to find out afterwards is that you get very fast at that cycle. That that cycle may seem like, well, I'm gonna spend a couple minutes adding the test and I'm gonna watch it, I'm gonna write a minute or so of code. It winds up being seconds and you get to that loop very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people come into TDD thinking this is really gonna slow me down. And it will at first. Mm -hmm. But then you get very, very fast and it becomes second nature. And you find you're switching between code and test, code and test, code and test, without even thinking that you're spending time doing it. I think mean, it's an important thing when trying to convince people to look at doing TDD is it becomes like a muscle memory, almost. Right. In a lot of ways. And just, just like anything in life, the first time you do it, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna take some time. When you first learned to ride a bicycle, did you immediately hop on and were rolling down the street at 30 miles an hour? No. Same thing with TBD. It's gonna be slow at first, but I guarantee you the investment that you put into learning how to do TBD and making it part of your practice is going to pay off when you don't have to spend late nights debugging stuff. Yes? For the kind of the follow-up to what both of you were saying, I had a terrible time trying to convince to adopt it. Mm -hmm. about doing this because it's extra. Mm -hmm. So are there metrics? I mean, are there numbers where you can go to a program manager and say, hey, yes, it's extra. Yes, in the short term, you might slow down. But mm -hmm. look at the bug counts, how they drop. Yes, and that, that's where a tool like, um, I'll, say, I'll say version one because we've used it at work. Um, but a, an agile project management tool like version one, like Rally, uh, things that provide numbers on how long am I spending on these tasks, what is my bug count, how many things are being reported in the field. It's going to take a while, so you can get those numbers. 
to me. have really good metrics on the sonar. Sonar, I'm not familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, it's an open source project. I think it does .NET as well as Java. Mm -hmm. It's it's Punsy Python installed. It's a it's a maiden driven project, and it comes up with its own website. Uh, what I did, um, it took me like three hours because I had to um, go ahead and put a proxy server in there because <laughs> I had a computer that had to pump. But um, um, it, it comes up with a website, and I put it at the top of the project. And the other projects go ahead and look at all of this in it. Metrics you're talking about are all there. It, it's got all these neat good things, good that you can give to your management. And when you make the changes, you know you can then reflect. But even before you get to that point, you're actually implementing. Are there is there any material out there that sort of helps you make the case before you even get started? There? In other organizations out there, here's how this happens. So there have been a number of case studies, even uh, published by Microsoft. My experience, sadly, has been. It doesn't matter. They're not going to hear it. It's fundamentally different to the way people have been developing software for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. They, people get stuck in their ways. Change is hard. They just, they, what, I've, what I've found, what I've had success with personally, is just doing it. I mean, do you have, most of the times when you want to introduce TDD or testing at all into your process, you don't have somebody sitting there over your over your shoulder looking at your code, what you're doing every minute of the day. So just do it. 